And we're going to attempt to get through both of these. Okay? So we're going to skip a lot. I'm going to hit some, some major points, but we're going to talk about some, some background stuff first. How many of you have read the Harry Potter stories? Now, almost all of you have. How many of you know how the stories began? That is, how she came up with the idea. Maybe. What? Didn't she come up with it on the train and then she thought yeah. Harry first? Yep. I did know. She did know. She was on a train in 1990. She was on a train from Manchester to London. And one moment while on that train, she was an unemployed, Unwed mother on Scottish welfare, essentially. She had been wed when she conceived the child, but her husband divorced her. We can talk about that later, because broken families are very prominent in the Harry Potter story. Um, seems to be a key, key theme. Okay, So she's on this train, and one minute she has no idea of Harry Potter. And like five seconds later, she has this fully formed idea of a boy who discovers on his 11th birthday that his parents were murdered by the greatest dark wizard who ever lived and that this dark wizard wants to kill him. One moment, no idea, poor, broke, penniless. The next moment, she has an idea, and within 17 years of having that idea, okay, she goes from being broke and penniless to what? One of the richest women in the world, the richest woman in the United Kingdom, wealthier than the Queen, if you can, yeah, damn, <laughs> if you can imagine that, okay, a billionaire, a billionaire, okay, she has that idea, where is it, in 1990, she starts writing, um, a lot of my students, when I do my Harry Potter course in London, they'll go up to to uh, Edinburgh, you know, do their little pilgrimage, go to the Elephant Cafe, and go to the other cafe, where she used to rock her daughter with her foot in the pram while writing the stories longhand on legal pads. So she sends it off. And I've got three different things written down here, because I've read all three of these, okay? That these are the number of rejections she received. The one I used in my class this morning was 20, because I've read in multiple places that she received 20 rejection letters, okay? But I just checked another thing tonight, and this is an interview where she mentions 12 rejections. She writes um, a letter. She sends a copy of the manuscript off to a publisher. The second, um, she also sent it off to literary agents. The second literary agent she sent it off to wasn't interested in um, shopping it for her, that shopping it out to other publishers, but he did say, I will represent you, okay? Not good enough to publish, but I'll represent you, okay? This guy made a killing off of her. His name's Christopher Little, by the way. He's one of the biggest literary agents in London now, okay? But 12 other publishers before Bloomsbury say no. Imagine you're the 11th one, and you say no to this book. Okay? Now, when the first book is published in 97, it's not an immediate bestseller. In fact, it doesn't get any real advertising. The way it sells is parents buy the book, they give it to their kid, their kid reads it, kid eats it up, kid loans it to a friend. Friend eats it up, asks mom or dad to buy it for them, loans it to somebody else. Okay? So it spreads through word of mouth. Books two and three are largely the same way. There's very little money spent on advertising for Chamber of Secrets and Prisoner of Azkaban. I first heard, first heard of the books, I think it was in 99. Um, this is, by the way, these are the British publication dates. The first American edition, inaptly titled Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, is published in 1998 in this edition, the Scholastic or Arthur A. Levine edition in the United States, okay? Um, I first heard of it in 99. I was driving into work one day, listening to NPR, back when I still listened to it, and uh, they had on their London bureau chief, and he was talking about this new series of books, kind of like C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, but not 
stodgy and preachy like C.S. Lewis was. Well, I teach C.S. Lewis. I teach courses on the Incus. I immediately put it out of my mind. I said, what an idiot for anybody to say something like that about Lewis. And within a couple of weeks, I was at Sam's Club, and there were all three of the first books. Okay? Or the first two books, I think it was. And I picked it, and I said, that's, that's that book T.R. Reed was talking about. I picked it up. I started reading the first chapter, and I stood there and read the entire first chapter. And put it in my cart because I bought it, and the next day I went back and bought the second one. The third one came out later on um, that spring, I believe. Okay? So she begins writing in 1990. She finishes the first novel in 95. By the time she finishes the first novel, she's already got notes for the next six. She knows when she's writing the first one, even though she doesn't have a publisher, that there's going to be seven books in this series. And the reason for that is there are seven books in the Chronicles of Narnia. And she kind of looked at it as similar to Chronicles of Narnia. She says in some interviews, C.S. Lewis is her favorite author. She says in other interviews, Jane Austen is her favorite author. Go figure. It's just like people saying, so-and-so is my best friend, and so-and-so is my best friend, and so-and-so is well, if you can have multiple best friends, apparently you can have multiple favorite authors, okay? It gets published in 97. Within 10 years, okay, she's a billionaire. This first book, when it gets published, she gets an advance from Bloomsbury for 1,500 pounds. She also had a Scottish Arts Council grant to help her pay her bills and such while she was writing the manuscript. I think that was... Something like 1,500 pounds also, okay? But she gets an advance of 1,500 pounds. When she sells the rights for this book to Arthur A. Levine, Scholastic Publishers in the United States, she sells the American rights for a little over $100,000. Which, when she's selling the, for the American rights, she is still unknown. Nobody's heard of her. 100 grand is a lot of money for an unknown author. Okay. But within a couple of years, she does start getting known. How in the United States does she get known? Or how is she known? What kind of press is she receiving? Negative. Yeah, negative. Why? My opinion, my terminology, wacko Christians coming out of the woodwork wanting to burn her at the stake. Why? They're all about magic. They're all about witches. And what do the Old Testament law books, Leviticus, Exodus, Numbers, etc., what do they say to do with witches? Burn them or stone them. Okay? And anybody to have anything to do with them. And they have spells in them. Wingardium Leviosa. Every spell in these books is what? Bad Latin. That is, they sound Latin, and some of them are Latin, but most of them are, are Latin 8. That is, they sound like they ought to be Latin, but they're not really Latin, most of them. Okay? Can you, can you actually point a stick at somebody and say, Avada Kedavra, and have them die? No, you're as likely to do that as we hear Mad Eye Moody say in the beginning of what? The fourth book, a whole classroom full of kids is going to harm him. Okay, It's not going to do any good. The stick isn't going to do any good. Even if you can find a unicorn and stick its hair up the inside of the stick, it's still a stick with a hair inside it. It doesn't mean anything. Okay? There's going to be a different kind of magic we'll talk about as we talk about these series. Um, other than the technical magic that we see the students learning, beginning with this first book all the way through the seventh book. Okay? So here's the publication history, which most of you are probably familiar with, because I'm sure many of you grew up reading these books about the times when they came out. Philosopher's Stone, and we're going to call it by its real title, came out in 97, Chamber of Secrets 98, Prisoner of Azkaban 99, Goblet of Fire 2000, and then you have a three-year break. All right. Order of the Phoenix came out in 2003. And what's the big difference between Goblet of Fire and Order of Phoenix? 
Yeah. Goblet of Fire is about like that. And Order of Phoenix is about double. American edition Order of Phoenix, 870 pages. Goblet of Fire, uh, 400 something. Right? It's, it's almost twice. Right? Um, Half Blood Prince, 2005. Deathly Hallows, 2007. Right? And I believe, I could be wrong here, but I think each of these come out on what date? July 31st. The reason I think that is because I was in London for each of these, for each of the releases, and didn't go to the release parties because I, I, I don't uh, have any truck for you know, people dressing up with hoods and capes and going all weird. One, actually the seventh book. A student got me a ticket to the, um, there's a podcast party at um, the largest Waterstones in London, which is the largest, largest bookstore in the United Kingdom. And there was this big podcast um, party. So they had people there until about nine o'clock and then they cleared everybody out. Okay, And then you could get in the line. Well, by the time you left about nine o'clock, the line to get a, to be in line to get the books at the midnight release was already a mile long. Okay, um, the people who were there for the party went down. They were in the front of the line when they went down, so that wasn't bad. Um, but what was interesting there was, you know, we left because I and I think my two oldest kids were there. We left, and there were people dressed up. As all of their favorite characters from the sixth book. Several of whom die in the seventh book. And they didn't know that, obviously. No. So they were getting the books at midnight, reading them and finding out, you know, the person they're dressed as, you know, gets um, killed off. Okay. Um, what else? In 2016, the entire... Harry Potter media, the Harry Potter conglomeration, if you want, was worth an estimated $25 billion. That's the Harry Potter studio tour in London, Universal Studios in Orlando. I don't know, do they have one in L.A.? Probably. Uh, all that kind of stuff. All told worth an estimated $25 billion. The books have sold, this is as of a couple of years ago, so I don't know what it is now. The books had sold, as of a couple of years ago, over 450 million copies. Other than the Bible, the best-selling book in history, okay, including the Bible, fastest-selling book in history. Because when this one came out, when the Goblet of Fire came out, that was the first time in world history you could buy a book and not have it in your hands. Because it was in 2000 that you had Amazon and Barnes & Noble offer the book online, and they had pre-sales. Okay? By the time this one came out, um, there were several million pre-ordered here. By the time Deathly Hallows came out in 2007, if I remember right, in the first 24 hours, it was something like 11 or 12 million copies were sold in 24 hours at what, 20 bucks a pop? That's an awful lot of money, okay? Which is another reason why you go from here to here, a lot more words, a lot more pages. What do you think is one reason why? Okay. This is the first book, Goblin Fire 2000. This is the first book that has midnight release parties. That is between Prisoner of Azkaban and this one. The world has gone crazy for Harry Potter. There are Articles galore about how J.K. Rowling has essentially reinvented reading for kids. I just had a colleague today tell me. His wife, who's a teacher at a, at a high school in a nearby county, has done an, a um, kind of an intervention program for, she's a high school teacher, for students with, with subpar reading levels, like kids in high school who are reading at a grade school level. Okay. And what she did is she devised this program using the Harry Potter stories. And within like a month or two, she has them going from like sixth grade reading 
to 11th grade reading. Okay? And there's really one reason for it. They get into these books. <laughs> They're easy to read, and they grab your attention. Okay? Now, these books, a lot of people say, and a lot of people in departments of English will say, you're reading Harry Potter in college? I mean, come on. College is supposed to be serious literature. You're supposed to be reading, I don't know, Catch-22 or Catcher in the Rye or other crap like that. Okay? All this realist or realistic fiction that deals with the problems of the real world. What problems of the real world are not included in all seven of these books? That is, in either book one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I bet any problem you could name, we could find it. Okay, prostitution. You don't find any prostitutes in Harry Potter. Sorry. It's not there. Terrorism? It's there. Evil? It's there. Bigotry? It's there. Prejudice? It's there. Hatred? It's there. Um, divorce? It's there. Broken families? It's there. Child abuse? It's there. Spousal abuse? Domestic abuse? Is there. Um, government leaders who lie to you? It's there. <laughs> Government leaders who are full of themselves, it's there. Most of the problems we see in our world are here. Okay? And they're in the Harry, they're in the Lord of the Rings, too. Why? Tolkien says in that very story essay that there's something wonderful you can do in fantasy literature that you can't necessarily do in other stuff. And that is. You can bring ideas in that people aren't aware of as them being real-world problems. For example, we're going to see in one of the books, one of the characters, we're going to call another character, a mudblood. The person who is called mudblood has no idea what it means. Harry has no idea what it means. Why? Harry hasn't been raised in the wizarding world. But somebody else who has been raised in the wizarding world gets very upset and tries to counter curse the guy who calls the girl this. And it's only after a few minutes they go off to Hagrid's hut and Hagrid tries to explain to them, well, it's about the foulest, rottenest thing you could call somebody. Okay? This is supposed to have or supposed to ring a bell in our real world. What's the real world equivalent? It's a nigger. Okay. Mudblood is an actual term used by the KKK in the early 20th century. Mud people. Leave the bud, blood pot, part. Leave the blood part off for a minute. The KKK often referred to blacks as mud people. The people who rose from the mud, and maybe not so much, according to the KKK. Okay? So we hear somebody use that. What does that do? That immediately tells us this person's mentality. It also tells us a little bit about how J.K. Rowling does some of her research. She doesn't just pull stuff out of the air. Okay? She, she's read widely. I didn't mention it. She's got a dual degree from the University of Exeter. She applied to Oxford. She didn't get in. Okay? Dual degree, University of Exeter. Classics and French. Classics, what's that? Latin and Greek. Okay, you don't major in Latin and Greek if you don't have a little bit of, you know, smarts going on. Okay? And French. She, I, I mentioned she had been married. She met her husband, Portuguese guy, when she was living in Portugal, teaching English. Okay? She marries this guy. Whirlwind romance, that is, they meet... They fall in love. They get married within like two or three months. She gets pregnant, and he divorces her within like six months between meeting, divorce. Okay? She goes back to Scotland and kind of mopes for a while, and then she starts looking for jobs and stuff. She's writing all the time. She says, she says in multiple places, She's always been a writer. She's been writing since she was six years old. Okay? Some of her stuff's good, the Harry Potter stories. The stories are good. The writing's kind of shaky. If you want to read her best writing, read her detective stories. 
written under the name of Robert Yes, I was going to say Richard. Robert Galbraith. Page about a guy named Cormorant Strank. Okay? Those don't have, because I've read the three that have been published so far, those don't have the problems that these have. That is loose threads, little errors in logic, little errors in facts. I've never read Casual Vacancy. I've tried. I picked it up in the bookstore, and I about wanted to barf after reading just the first two or three pages. And here's why. After writing this, she's been hailed so much as a great writer. She says in a couple of interviews, she wanted to try her hand at serious fiction. Well, what does serious fiction often mean in the late 20th, early 21st century? My opinion, unreadable fiction. That is, something with multiple plot lines and something also that is going to have evoke what kind of attitude in the reader? Is it going to make you feel good like these often do? No. It's going to be depressing as all hell. Why? Because that's serious. That's what the literary intelligentsia tell us is serious fiction. Something that deals with the sorrows and woes of crappy everyday life. So you have people have affairs left and right in this little town that you know the story is set in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're going to leave all that aside. Okay, so we start with the first one. Now, the real title is Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. What is the Philosopher's Stone? It's like the uh, chemical of Holy Grail. Okay. It comes from alchemy. What's alchemy? The precursor of modern science. Without alchemy, we wouldn't have had Isaac Newton. We wouldn't have had Albert Einstein. We wouldn't have had modern science. Okay? Alchemy had as its central goal essentially one thing, purification. Okay? The alchemists sought to create the Philosopher's Stone because with it, they could change what is called base metal, like lead, okay, into gold. <laughs> and with that stone, you could also create what is called the elixir of life. You drink it, and you don't die. You have to keep drinking it, by the way. It's not one sip, you live forever, okay? Which, by the way, um, there's a Latin term, aqua vitae, means the water of life. Anybody know what that actually is? It's whiskey. The word whiskey means water of life. So if you're a whiskey drinker, just by the way. So the Philosopher's Stone. Was the Philosopher's Stone real? Or did people in the Middle Ages and earlier and later think it was real? Or it was possible to be created? Yes, they did. People actually sought to create this thing. There are people still today. Why? Because there are still alchemists today. Still people who really believe in alchemy. All right? Think that they can create that. How, old, how far does it go back? It goes back to ancient China. It goes back to ancient, ancient Egypt. Okay? I've got a book in my office It's about, oh, that thick. It's called The Philosopher's Stone, and it's all about the search for it, okay? So the Philosopher's Stone is this thing of philosophical and alchemical inquiry. By the way, the alchemists weren't necessarily looking or seeking just transformation of metal from one level to a higher level. That was a physical representation of what they were really seeking. Okay? I use the word transmutation. There's another word for it, though. The transformation of something low and common to something high and rare and unique. 
They were seeking the purification of the body and the soul. Right? Has some Christian elements to it. Has other non-Christian elements to it. But that's what the alchemists were all about. What about the sorcerer stuff? Has anybody really sought that? Has anybody really tried to make it? Has anybody ever really thought it was real? No. Why? Because that was created by Arthur A. Levine in about 1998. When he bought the rights to this book, one of the first things he said was, but we can't publish a book for children with the word philosopher in it. Americans will never buy that book for their children. They'll never buy a book for children with, with any kind of word related to philosophy. Why? Because Americans are stupid, Arthur A. Levine thought. That's also why I can bring in my British editions and show you the difference. If you look at an American edition and look at the page like this, there's more white space on an American edition page than there is on a British edition. That is, the British edition packs more words on a page. It's like Americans, we read real slow like, and we need, we need spaces between the words because we gotta you know, space them out a little bit, okay? The British edition, for example, of Order of the Phoenix, it's just a little over 600 pages. The American edition is 870. That's how much more crammed in the words are. Right? So he comes up with the bright idea, sorcerer's stone. Why? Well, because these are little witches and wizards. They are, in other words, sorcerers. I mentioned the wacko Christians. What angered them? Well, you got that word sorcerer right in the title. And... Good Christians are not supposed to have anything to do with sorcery. Therefore, get rid of this book. One year when I was teaching my old English and Beowulf graduate level courses, one of the students um, was a slightly older student. She had four or five children. Her father, what, her father, what in the world, man? Her husband was a minister at some local church. And I went off on a tear one day about the Harry Potter stuff. And she came up and she goes, Dr. Sherman, I can't believe you. You actually teach those books. That you encourage people to. That you encourage your children to. And I, I can't remember her name. Um, but it was Agatha or something like that. And I said, Agatha, you know, here's what I tell everybody. Read a book before you burn it. At least know what it says for yourself. Don't take what somebody else says about it. And there were, I mean, two or three times during that semester. She wanted to talk to me about these books because I think she thought my soul was in danger of, you know, damnation because I was leading children to witchcraft and wizardry, et cetera. I've had other students essentially kind of say the same thing. I have yet to deal with um, any parents. It's probably because I don't answer my phone call. Okay, so <laughs> it's not Harry Potter and the sorcerer's stuff. It's the philosopher's stuff. And it even gets brought out in a later book. Okay. When they're talking about, well, yeah, but Harry, didn't you? And the character of Neville says, yeah, Harry, didn't you deal with that? And he calls it the phosphorus stone in the British book. In the American book? Because the guy come up with Dudley, with Neville screwing it up, he calls it the sorceress book. Okay, or the sorceress stuff. So, how's it open? Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. Okay? The thank you very much is quintessentially British. Well, what are we told just in that opening sentence about the Dursleys? Notice, they think of themselves we're told, I need a marker that is darker. They think of themselves as perfectly normal. How do they define perfectly normal? They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious. In other words, perfectly normal does not equal 
or is opposed to anything strange and mysterious. Okay? So what do we see happen in that first chapter? What is not perfectly normal in that first chapter? Okay? He goes off to work, and what does he see? Yeah, people in robes and capes walking around. Okay? There's a cat sitting on the wall, staring at him, reading a map. Cats don't read maps. He goes off to work. He sees the people. He has some weird-looking little dude in a cape come up to him and say stuff. He sees owls. Okay. Later on that evening, the cat is still outside his house. And who shows up at the end of the street? This pretty weird guy. Okay. Page 8. Nothing like this man had ever been seen on Privet Drive. He was tall, thin, very old, judging by the silver of his hair and beard, which were both long enough to tuck into his belt. How's that for strange and mysterious? Wearing long robes, purple cloak that swept the ground. The cloak is on top of the long robes. And high-heeled, buckled boots. Not stilettos, don't go that far, but, you know. His eyes were light, bright, sparkling, Half moon spectacles, long crooked bent nose. His name is Albus Dumbledore. And he starts talking to the cat, and the cat turns into a person. We're not in Kansas anymore, right? Okay, that's telling us this world is different than our world, but it's not. That's one of the genius things that J.K. Rowling does. Okay? Back when I edited a journal called Myth Lord, um, Somebody submitted an article, and I can't remember the person's name, and I can't remember the article. But the, there's one thing about the article I remember, and it's that the person brought in the idea of wainscoting. Wainscoting is like, if this were a room in a house, when you put wood paneling up to about this high, all the way across the, the lower section, okay? And the person brought up the idea of wainscoting and said, J.K. Rowling has written a kind of a Wayne Scott fantasy. And what the author meant by that is wainscoting is laid over on top of the material of the wall. J.K. Rowling has overlaid her world onto our world. Or the way I will describe it later is you have our world, like this, and then you have the wizarding world, like that. Guess what? It's the same world. It's exactly the same world. What is really the difference between the two? Perception. Perception. What are we going to be told repeatedly about muggles? They, no, it's not that they're stupid. Well, some will say that about them. They don't see so good. They don't look properly. Okay. So, we see the dialogue between, and we're going to skip, like I said, an awful lot. The dialogue between McGonagall and... Dumbledore, but what do we hear McGonagall say? We hear a couple of things. She mentions the Potters, and she mentions this guy that Dumbledore names, though she doesn't, Lord Voldemort. Or if you want to pronounce it according to French, Voldemort. All right? But Voldemort, or Voldemort, has three elements. Val comes from volare, Latin. It means fly or flee. Dead means out or away. And mort, don't write mort down again. Death, to fly or flee from death. He doesn't want to die. Okay. Albus Dumbledore. Albus just means white. Dumbledore is Latin. Is um, Dumbledore is Old English for bumblebee. The white bumblebee. So what the hell does that mean? Well, think about it as we...
go throughout the rest of these books. So they talk back and forth, and Dumbledore says, Voldemort has powers he will never have. She goes, no, you're just too noble to use them. In other words, you could if you wanted to. Okay. So Dumbledore mentions, or talks about, says, affirms, Harry Potter's parents were killed, but Harry wasn't. And she's like, why? Why? Why couldn't he kill this little boy after all the people he's killed? Dumbledore says, we may never know. He's lying through his teeth, by the way. He has a pretty good idea of why. What day is this, by the way? Uh, it's November 1st. Okay. McGonagall says, when Dumbledore says, it's okay, I've left a letter. That is, I'm going to leave a letter with the baby for the Dursleys to read and understand everything. She says, a letter, page 13. Really, Dumbledore, you think you can explain all this in a letter? These people will never understand him. He'll be famous, a legend. I wouldn't be surprised if today was known as Harry Potter Day in the future. There will be books written about him. Every child in our world will know his name. Dumbledore, exactly. Be enough to turn any boy's head. Famous before he can walk and talk. No, this, he'll be better off this way. Okay, so she says, I wouldn't be surprised if in the future this day is known as Harry Potter Day. I don't know if anybody is, but if you were aware, in the Christian calendar, what is November 1st? All Saints Day. It's All Saints Day. Right? Why? Because 1031 is All Hallows Eve. Hallow is another word for this. This is also called All Hallows Day. Okay. And what did she just say? I wouldn't be surprised if in the future this is called Harry Potter Day. Later on in the series, Harry's going to be referred to somebody, referred to by somebody as Saint Potter. Okay. All Saints Day, Saint Potter. He's also going to be called um, fifth book, Patronus. Potter, okay? Like patron, as in patron saint. We'll talk about that more later. So, they leave Harry there, and ten years go by. We get the chapter of the letters from no one. Well, the letters aren't from no one. But how do the letters arrive? First one comes in the mail. And Harry gets the mail, and he's handing the mail to Mr. Dursley, and he's got this letter for me. And Dudley's like, what are you doing? He goes, it's a letter for me. He's almost 11. He's never had a letter before in his entire life. He's never had a birthday card, in other words, from another family member. Okay? Dudley grabs it out of his hand. Vernon grabs it out of his hand. Vernon and Petunia get the scared look on their face. What happens the next day? Letters come again. How? These ones come through the chimney. The next day they come. They're starting to come and be pushed through the cracks in the doors. So that Vernon nails the doors closed, nails the windows closed. Because they're coming all over the place. Finally, how do the last set of letters get delivered to the house before they leave the house? Yeah. When the milkman delivers... The morning dairy products, milk and eggs, they open the door, after removing the nails and everything, they open the door, and it's like Petunia's getting ready to make scrambled eggs for breakfast. She cracks an egg, and rather than yolk and white coming out, a little tiny folded up letter comes out. And the letter expands as you unfold it. And every one of the eggs, I think there's two dozen, Every one of the eggs has one of these letters. Okay, what should they immediately know? What should that automatically tell you? First of all, how do you get a chicken to lay eggs with letters inside them? You don't. This is, this is the definition of futility, trying to stop these letters from coming. 
They should just give up right then. Nope. What does Vernon do? Packs them all up. They leave. They go off to a hotel. A little rundown hotel. The next morning, Harry gets 100 letters at that hotel. Now, Vernon's kind of going crazy here. So what do they do the next night? Where do they spend the next night? On a hut. Excuse me. In a hut. On a rock. In the sea. And at midnight, the door gets knocked down by Hagrid. It's midnight of what day? July 31st. It's Harry's birthday. Why is July 31st Harry's birthday? Because it's J.K. Rowling's birthday. Very good. Okay. So he's watching the minute hand on Dudley's watch move down. And it strikes midnight. Hagrid bursts the door open. And we get a discussion, which we're going to skip quite a bit of. And Hagrid is surprised to find out Harry doesn't know anything. He says, do you mean to tell me, page 49, this boy, this boy knows nothing about, about anything? And Harry's like, you know, I'm not a complete dolt. I know some things. I, I know some math and stuff. Hagrid, I mean, our world, your world, my world, your parents' world. Harry's like, what are you talking about? Dursley, your parents are famous. No, nah, not my parents. Okay. Vernon says, I forbid you. And Hagrid tells him, you're a... Wizard, Harry. A what? You're a wizard. And a mighty thump, uh, thumping good one, I'd say, once you've been trained up a bit. With a mom and dad like yours, what else would you be? And I reckon it's about time you read your letter. And he pulls out the letter. What does the letter have on the envelope? Mr. H. Potter, the floor, hut on the rock, the sea. So wherever Harry goes, these letters will find him. And so he reads about it. Vernon says, you know, we swore we'd stamp it out of him. Harry's like, you knew? You knew I was a wizard? 53. Petunia just blows. I mean, how long has this been bottled up? Years. Not 10 years. Since she was young. Yeah, we, we find out later. Knew? No. Of course we knew. How could you not be my dratted sister being what she was? Oh, she got a letter just like that and disappeared off to that, that school. Came home every vacation with her pockets full of frog spawn, turning teacups into rats. I was the only one who saw her for what she was. A freak. The same exact language Dudley used to describe the people he saw on the streets. Okay? Then she met that potter at school. They left her and got married and had you. Of course I knew you'd be just the same, just as strange, just as, as abnormal. And then they got blown up. And we got landed with you. Nothing else about the being blown up. Okay. So Hagrid has to tell Harry about Voldemort. Vernon says, I agree there's something strange and odd about you, something that a good beating wouldn't take care of. But we're not going to send you to that school with that crackpot old, and he insults Dumbledore. It's a little much for Hagrid, so he puts a pigtail on their son, Dudley. So chapter 5, I'm trying to get us through this one pretty fast. So chapter 5, Hagrid takes Harry, I'll leave that one off, takes Harry off to Diagon Alley. Say those two words very fast, and you get what word? Diagonal. Diagonal. Why? Because Diagon Alley isn't somewhere that we, assuming you're all muggles, see clearly. What must you do to see it other than go through the leaky cauldron, go through the back door, find the trash can, go up three bricks and tap, you know, three times? It's kind of a thing where you've got to shift your perspective, all right? Hagrid says, you know, most muggles can't see us. Most muggles don't pay any, any attention to us, right? So he goes into Diagon Alley to get all of his school things. Where's the first place he goes? And Gringotts, why? Yeah. To get money to buy supplies. What does Harry discover in Gringotts? How rich? He's loaded. He thinks, man, if the Dudley, if the if the Dursleys knew I had all this money, it's not a good question to think about, by the way, because you know Harry might disappear. 
He wouldn't actually. The Dursleys never actually physically do anything to him. I'd have to starve him. So he goes to Gringotts. Hagrid's got to get something there. And while Hagrid needs to go get a drink after being in Gringotts, Harry goes to get his robe. And he meets another boy there. The boy's not named at this point. Is he? Um, no, he's not. He tells him, my father's next door looking at brooms and stuff. And he talks to Harry. And what are we introduced to right here? I mean, we're not even 100 pages into the first novel. Classism. Classism. Okay. Quidditch is introduced or is mentioned. The houses are mentioned. Go back to this for a minute. What about classism? Is it really classism? Because he also says something else. He introduces the idea of blood. Pure blood. As opposed to mixed blood. Okay. He points at Hagrid. The other boy does. And says, I say, look at him. You know, he's a summit kind of savage. Harry finally knows something this kid doesn't know. And he's like, I think he's wonderful. Okay. Hagrid comes back, tells Harry not to worry about it, so they go off to get Harry's wand. He meets Ollivander. And Ollivander tells him, what about wands? Wand chooses the wizard. Always. Okay. Bottom page 84, he's been measuring Harry, having Harry try wands, and he finally says, hmm, I wonder, why not? Let's give it a shot. Holly and Phoenix feather. Okay. Harry picks up this wand, swishes it with his right hand, because he's right-handed, and what happens? Red and gold sparks fly out. Ollivander, bravo, bravo, yes indeed, oh, very good. How curious, 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 Harry, I'm it's curious. What do you mean? I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter, every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather is in your wand gave another feather. Just one. Very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand when its brother, why, its brother gave you that scar. And its brother was you and phoenix feather. Okay? These are symbolic. Right? This is a poisonous wood to most animals. There is one that can eat it, or that can eat its leaves. Okay? Only one animal that can eat its leaves. This, most animals don't eat the leaves. Why? Holly leaves are generally shaped like that. Okay? These are points on the end, thorns. What do hollies produce during the winter? What kind of berries? Bright red berries. Okay? So you've got thorns shaped, a thorn shaped leaf shaped kind of how? It's kind of circular. In the Middle Ages, that was symbolic. That was taken as symbolic of the crown of thorns that Christ wore. And the red berries? Blood. Okay. But it's a holly bush. Hollies are not like oaks and maples. Oaks and maples lose their leaves every fall, and then they regrow new ones every spring. Holly leaves stay on year-round. They are thus evergreen. That is, they don't die. They don't go dormant. What about a phoenix? What does a phoenix do? Every 500 years... The phoenix self-immolates on its nest. That is, it poof, bursts into flame. Out of the ashes on the nest, a little phoenix bird arises, and it lives for 500 years. Poof! So what do you have there? Death, resurrection. Death, resurrection. Go to the, um, if it's still there, Last time I, in Strat I was in Stratford, it was there. 
Go to the Trinity Church in Stratford-on-Avon where Shakespeare is buried, and there's an altar about the size of that table back there, and on the altar is a cloth, and the cloth is embroidered with this beautiful golden phoenix. Why? Christ died, and Christ rose again. Okay? So the phoenix in the Middle Ages was frequently used as a symbol for Christ. Well, is that saying these are both symbols for Christ? No, we're talking about the imagery of death and resurrection. What have we already said about the person who wields this, his name? Flee from death. He doesn't want to die. Well, having a phoenix tail feather would be pretty good then to have in your lawn. Because phoenixes don't stay dead. Okay? They come back from life. Okay? This, evergreen, ever living, this becomes Harry's. Question becomes, in the seventh book, does Harry really die? Does he mostly die, but not completely die? Or does he only, only think he's dead? We'll talk about that as we get to it. Sorry to give away anything. Um, so, Ollivander sells him his wand, and Harry goes on. Okay? Journey from platform nine and three quarters. He meets the Weasley family. They help him through the barrier. He gets on the train, and he makes a new friend in Ron. Why do he and Ron hit it off so well? I mean, Harry's completely foreign to the wizarding world. Ron has what kind of experience in the wizarding world? They're both kind of the underdogs. Okay. How is Ron an underdog? Comes from a big family. He's been overshadowed by all his brothers. Big family, overshadowed by all his brothers, and what else about him? They're poor. <laughs> I mean, his father works for the government, but he's got a crappy job working for the government. Okay? He's got, what is it, five older brothers and one younger sister. If any of you come from large families, I'm the youngest of five, what does the youngest usually get? Hand-me-downs. You get the bike that's been handed down, you know, that's by the time you get it, 20 or 30 years out of date. You get the clothes that are handed down, that are repaired, etc. Ron is the same way. What else do you get? Well, if the family doesn't move and they go to the same schools all the time, oh, you're so-and-so's brother, or if sister, sister, etc. What does that mean? Well, if so-and-so, one, two, three, four, five, are all really good students, what does that mean for you? What are the expectations? You're going to be as bright as they are. You know, if they have athletic abilities, you're going to have the same athletic abilities they're going to have. Ron's got all this to live up to. After all, we're going to find out about his older brothers. We had head boys. We had prefects. We had captains of the Quidditch team. And Ron's kind of gangly and an idiot, <laughs> to put it mildly. Okay? What about Harry? I mean, once Ron learns who Harry is, like you're Harry Potter. He has nothing in common with Ron, right? How much stuff has Harry had in his life? When the novel opens, where does Harry live? Yeah, in the closet, under the, the cupboard under the stairs. The first letter is addressed to Mr. H. Potter, covered under the stairs, number four, Privet Drive. What do they do after that? Well, we better move him out of the cupboard. So they give him Dudley's spare bedroom. Next set of letters come, Mr. H. Potter, spare room, number four, Privet Drive. So whoever's, you know, keeping tabs, they understand that. Okay? Harry's had nothing all his life. So he's, he kind of understands Ron, but now he's loaded. The trolley cart comes by with all the goodies, and what does Harry do? He almost buys all of it. Yeah, it's like, dig in, man. Have what you want, Ron. That's where he learns about chocolate frog cards that become very important later on in this novel because he completely forgets something he read on this very first journey. All right? So, who else shows up? Oh, let me just back up for a minute. Page 106, 107. They're talking about school and talking about Ron's family. Ron tells them about his family. Charlie's in Romania studying dragons. I mean, how cool is that? You got a brother who studies and trains dragons. What could be more cool? He's got another brother 
working for Gringotts Bank in Africa. Later we learn what he's doing. He's breaking spells for them. How cool is that? Okay. What's Ron going to do? No idea. What does two older brothers, immediately older brothers, want to do? Joke shop. Shut up a joke shop. Okay. Draco Malfoy comes in. Page 108. Is it true? They're saying all down the train that Harry Potter is in this compartment. So it's you, is it? Harry, yes. He looks at the other two boys, one on either side of Draco. They're always there. These are bookends that Draco just kind of carries with them. They're the muscle that he doesn't have. Oh, this is Crab and this is Goyle. Doesn't matter which one you call Crab and which one you call Goyle, by the way. And my name's Malfoy. Draco Malfoy. And Ron laughs. Right? Because who wants to be called Dragon Bad Faith? That's what his name means. Malfoy. The foy comes from French. Foy. Mal is bad, like maladjusted, okay? Malcontent. It doesn't mean bad faith in the Malfoys. It's the Malfoys have bad faith. Why? Who do they look up to? Voldy. I'm just going to use his nickname. It's too hard to write with my shoulder, okay? So I think my name's funny, do you? Nobody, no need to ask who you are. My father told me all the Weasleys have red hair, freckles, more children they can afford. You'll soon find out some wizarding families are much better than pot, others, Potter. Who does that sound like? The Dursleys? You don't want to go making friends with the wrong sort. I can help you there. And he holds out his hand. What is he offering Harry? Okay, first of all, friendship. But what comes with Malfoy's implying his friendship? Power? I mean, he's 11 years old. What kind of power does he have? But his father has power, status. He's saying, I can introduce you to the right people. This, this is not the right people. Weasleys are definitely not the right people. I mean, just when we find out what kind of job Mr. Weasley has at the Ministry of Magic, it's like, definitely going nowhere, you know. Harry, I think I could tell who the wrong side are for myself, thanks. What's that showing us? Moral fiber. Moral fiber, as it's called later on. In other words, Harry, at this point, already has what is popularly termed a moral compass. His, his needle knows which way to point, so to speak. All right? Malfoy didn't go red, but he gets kind of pink. I'd be careful if I were you, Potter. Unless you're a bit politer, you'll go the same way as your parents. What's he just said? You'll die. Your parents were killed. Why? Because they weren't polite. No. They didn't know what was good for them. What's he saying? If only your parents had sided with Voldemort, they'd still be alive. Throughout all seven books, are we ever told that Voldemort asked them to? No, we're not. It's, it's never suggested. Okay? You hang around with a riffraff like the Weasleys and that Hagrid, and it'll rub off on you. What will rub off? Riffraffery? <laughs> the quality of riffraffness? Okay? Harry and Ron stand up. Ron, you say that again. That is, insult me to my face. Oh, you're going to fight us? Harry, unless you get out now. What experience has Harry had fighting? <laughs> Dudley's been beating him up for the last 10 years. How much of a fight has Harry put back? Well, you know, oddly enough, he uh, finds himself outside Peck Hall, and the wind blows him up to the roof. Yeah, right. Dudley and his gang are beating on him, and he suddenly finds himself on top of the school gymnasium, and he attributes it to the wind. You seen much wind blow a 60, 70, 80-pound 80 year old, 80-pound boy from the ground up to 30 or 40 feet off the ground? Not usually. Not even 100-mile-an-hour winds do that. 
Okay. Dudley punches him. His glasses are fixed. He gets his hair cut, and it grows out the next day. There's something weird about this kid. So, Harry, unless you get out now, what's this show us? He'll stand up for himself. Is he going to win this fight? Hell no. <laughs> How big are Crab and Goyle? Yeah, if, if, yeah, deadly size or larger. I mean, they're always described kind of as gorillas. So you've got Malfoy, who's thin. He's a wimp. He's a mama's boy. We'll see that later. And Crab and Goyle, either side. I mean, they are his henchmen, so to speak. Ron is tall and gangly. Harry's just kind of gangly. He's got no muscle or brawn on him. Okay, so the sorting hat. Ron thinks it's some test because his brother told him, brothers told him that. Okay, Harry goes up to have the sorting hat put on, page 121. He sits down, he puts the hat on, and he hears a voice. Hmm, difficult, very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind. Talent. Oh, my goodness, yes. And a nice thirst to prove yourself. Now, that is interesting. So where shall I put you? And Harry just thinks, not Slytherin, not Slytherin. What does not Slytherin mean? Not a Draco. Anywhere else, <laughs> but not Slytherin. Why not Slytherin? Who has he heard from Slytherin? Whom has he heard from Slytherin? Draco. Hagrid and Ron. Hagrid and Ron both say negative things about Slytherin. Draco says, I'll be in Slytherin because all my family is. And he's like, I don't want to be in that one. So not Sly So what does not Slytherin mean? Hufflepuff? Fine. Ravenclaw? Fine. Gryffindor? Fine. He gets put in Gryffindor. Because he gets put in Gryffindor, what does everybody assume about Gryffindor? It's the best house there is. So Gryffindor is up here. So you have Gryffindor, Slytherin's at the bottom. Or is it? Is Slytherin at the bottom? Or is Hufflepuff at the bottom? <laughs> you know, and Ravenclaw's here. Ravenclaw's just for the nerds. Okay. Get online, do your you know, sorting and everything through Pottermore and all that kind of stuff. Okay? I've never gone through. Never go through all the way. I'd be a Hufflepuff in a heartbeat, okay? So, he gets put into, let me go back again, not Slytherin, not Slytherin. And the voice says, are you sure? Notice this, the head is, is questioning Harry. You sure? You could be great. It's all here in your head. And Slytherin will help you on the way to greatness. No doubt about that. No? Okay, better be Gryffindor. Notice, if it's not Gryffindor, or if it's not Slytherin, it's got to be Gryffindor. Why? Those two are the closest. What really separates them? One's evil, one's good? No. What's the difference between them? Ambition. Yeah. Gryffindors don't show the same kind of ambition. I'm going to throw another word in front of ambition. The cunning ambition. We're going to hear repeatedly, or we're going to hear throughout the series, other things get added to slithering. They'll do what? To get their way. Anything. Whatever it takes. Use the ring? Hell yes. <laughs> if I find the ring and it'll make me great and powerful, then I'm going to use that ring. Okay? Go back for a moment to what the hat says. Here's what it sees in Harry. It's difficult. It sees all this stuff about him and it says, you know, I don't know where to put you. Some of the people, the hat barely touches them. Bing! You know? Like it doesn't even get on Draco's head all the way. And it's Slytherin. Like he just reeks of Slytherin. Plenty of courage. Where have we seen that? On the train. Yeah. Not if you don't leave. That is, yeah, we'll fight you. I'm going to get the snot beat out of me. But yeah, we'll fight you. Okay. Not a bad mind either. Is that a ringing endorsement of Harry's intellect? Would you like to get written on a paper? Not a bad intellect. 
Is that as good as genius? Brilliant? No, it's kind of, you know, damning with faint praise. We're praising with not so faint damning. <laughs> There's talent. Oh my goodness, yes. What's talent? Raw potential. Raw potential. Natural raw ability. It's Peyton Manning probably picking up a football for the first time. Perfect spiral. And his first coach going, damn, I don't know that I can teach that kid much. Okay. Or Michael Jordan with a basketball, you know. Raw talent and ability. But what always has to happen with raw talent? It's got to be coached. It's got to be finessed. It's got to be practiced. Okay. So, courage, not a bad mind. Talent, and what's the last thing? A thirst to prove yourself. Why does Harry have a thirst to prove himself? What's the legacy? The boy who lived. The one who defeated Lord Voldemort, who doesn't remember it. Okay? This child of James and Lily Potter, etc. Okay? So he goes off to... Gryffindor. Okay, we meet the potions master, Severus Snape. What does he do to Harry? First day of class. Three questions. Based on what? Based on the potions textbook. Yeah. And he says, what? Didn't think you'd do any homework before coming to class? Harry's like, no. <laughs> no, I didn't read anything. Who does? Hermione knows all the answers. Why? Because she's probably memorized the damn book by now. Okay? So, I'm skipping a bunch. You get the Midnight Duel. What do they discover in the Midnight Duel? Which isn't actually a duel, because Malfoy just sets Harry up to get caught. He doesn't show up, right, in the Midnight Duel? What do they discover? They run up to that third floor, which they were told by Dumbledore, third floor is off limits. Big, massive, three-headed dog behind a door, okay? So then they go off to, I'm skipping around a little bit, they're first learning how to fly lesson. This is the, the field trip I take my students on in London. This is the thing they like the most, even though it's the most arduous day. It's a four-hour train ride up to Annex, um, Northumbria, just an hour south of Edinburgh. And we walk all over the castle that they shot this scene and several others. Big, massive castle. Um, it's really, really cool. What, why is this scene so significant? When Harry learns to fly, he stands up for someone else. He stands up for whom? Neville. Neville. Why? Because Neville's a moron. He can't really stand on his own, really. Okay. Neville's grandmother sent him what? In the mail. Remember. The remember all. Why? Because he doesn't remember much. And Neville takes off in his room, flies up 30, 40 feet, falls, breaks his arm. Madame Hooch takes him off to the infirmary. She says, you all stay put. Malfoy takes it, gets on his broom, and goes off. And Hermione says, page 148, when Harry yells, give it here, Malfoy. No, Hermione says. Madame Hooch told us not to move, but get us all into trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood, uh, bottom 148. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted the broom and kicked hard against the ground. And up, up, he soared. Air rushed through his hair. And what happens? A fierce, a rush of fierce joy, he realized he found something he could do without being taught. In other words, raw talent. This was easy. This was wonderful. And he knows how to work the broom. Pull it up, slow it down, go this way, go this way, go this way, go this way. You know, kind of not rocket science. And he goes after Malfoy. Give it here, Malfoy, or I'll knock you off that broom. Malfoy, oh yeah? Trying to sneer, but looking worried. In other words, he doesn't think Harry's going to be able to fly. Harry somehow knew what to do. No crab and goyle appear to save your neck, Malfoy. 
In other words, it's just you and me, even playing field. Malfoy says, okay, catch it if you can. And he lobs it. And it goes way up like this. And Harry sees it. Notice Harry doesn't chase it. What does he do? He watches the arc. He does a little trigonometry in his head. Not. Harry's not that bright. Okay. He watches it, and he makes a dive for where he thinks that ball's going to fall. And just before he hits the ground, he catches it. And there's McGonagall. <clears throat> She thinks, he thinks, he's busted. But McGonagall thinks instead, what? She has a seeker. Why is she willing to bend? Bend. Like taking this end and this end and touching them together. Why is she willing to bend the rules and make Harry a seeker in his first year, which then allows him also to have a broom? Okay, she sees the talent. Why? They haven't won the House Cup. Who did last year and the year before? Snape. Slytherin has. She wants to get back at Snape. Okay? So she introduces him to Oliver Wood. All right? Um, they almost get caught during the quote-unquote midnight duel by because of Peeves and such. They find the big uh, three-headed dog. Halloween comes. We get the... the uh, troll in the bathroom. But what happens just before that? Before they go to uh, before they go to the feast, they have a class. Okay? And it's charms, and they're doing Wingardium Leviosa. And Ron can't get the feather to move at all. And Hermione says you're doing it all wrong. It's Wingardium Leviosa. And she makes it float, and Flitwick gets all, you know, chittery and stuff. And as they're leaving, later on, I think it's potions, Ron says to Harry, page, no, it's when they're leaving Flitwick's, page 172, Ron's in a sour, bad mood. And he says, it's no wonder no one can stand her. She's a nightmare, honestly. Hermione bumps into Harry as she rushes past. She's in tears. I think she heard Ron. So she must have noticed she's got no friends. Okay. They go on to other classes. Hermione doesn't show up. They go to dinner. Hermione doesn't show up. Quirrell comes in, announces there's a troll in the basement. Harry and Ron go off with the other first years back to their dorms, and they realize... The troll's in the bathroom. Key's in the lock, Harry says, when they lock it in. But then they hear a scream. And they realize Hermione's in there. Okay? Their first years, how much magic can they do? Barely lift a feather. Barely lift a feather. Okay? And they go and take on the troll. How do they take on the troll? Brute force. Harry jumps on the troll's back and does what? Accidentally. Sticks his nice holly and phoenix wand right up the troll's nose. Kind of, you know, is a little uncomfortable for the troll. Ron does Wingardium Leviosa on the troll's club so it rises up above his head and then falls and hits him on the head and knocks him out. And at that point, McGonagall comes in. And they think, we're dead. We're out of here. We're expelled. Until Hermione does something. Hermione doesn't really do that much. What does she do? To a teacher. She lies to a teacher. For what reason? To save Harry and Ron. What happens to the three of them as a result of that? Okay, they become friends. How thick of friends do they become? One through seven, Hermione never turns her back on Harry. Ron will twice. Okay. Hermione never does. So we get Quidditch. And Quidditch, in both the books and the films, becomes a major element. More so in the films than in the books. 
you notice that? If you've seen the films, right? And yet, when you get to the final two books, how important is Quidditch? No. Not. Why is it important overall? Ultimately, it's because of this first Quidditch match. Because Harry captures the snitch in this match, but he captures it how? He almost, he almost swallows it. So he doesn't touch it with his hands. And even if he did, he has what on? Gloves. Okay? So, Christmas comes. Chapter 12, Mirror of Erised. I'm trying to get through this as quickly as possible. Mirror of Erised, chapter 12. Christmas comes. And uh, let's see here. Ron's teaching Harry wizard, wizard chess and such. And Christmas morning arrives. And Harry wakes up to presents. Ron says, Merry Christmas, page 200. Harry, you too. Look at this. I've got presents. Why is it said that way? He's not had them before. What did you expect? Turnips? Notice Harry doesn't answer the question. He doesn't say, well, I've never gotten any presents before. All right? He gets a present from Aunt Petunia and Uncle Vernon. He gets a 50 pence piece. All right? There's something else. He gets a present from Mrs. Weasley. He gets a Weasley sweater. Okay. He gets a large box of chocolate frogs from Hermione. So the Weasleys, uh, excuse me, the Dursleys, the Weasleys, Hermione. There's one parcel left. Something fluid and silvery gray. Oh, what else did he get? Hagrid carved him a flute. Where? either before now or anywhere after this, do we see Hagrid carve anything? Do we see Hagrid have or show any musical interest at all? We don't at all. It is merely a plot device. This She has to do this because she's going to have something else happen, but it doesn't fit with Hagrid's character. Okay. So the other thing, Ron, I know what those are. That's really valuable. What is it? It's an invisibility cloak. Try it on. So Harry puts it on and he starts to go invisible. And there's a note. Your father left this in my possession before he died. It is time it is returned to you. Use it well. Okay. What else does Harry have that belonged to his parents? Zip. He has nothing. Does Harry even have a photograph of his parents? No, he doesn't know what they look like. Right. So, he has an invisibility cloak, and it says, use it well. You have something that makes you invisible. You are in this thousand-year-old castle that has rooms and passageways that nobody has found. What are you going to do? And you're an 11-year-old kid. So, man, you're going to put that thing on, and you're going to go out and start exploring, right? So... Later that evening, after Christmas dinner, Harry's lying in bed, looks at the note, use it well, and he goes out. He's going to go to the library because they're trying to find out who Nicholas Flamel is. And he goes into a room, and in this room is this large mirror, stretches from the floor to the ceiling. Page 207. The mirror has an ornate gold frame, and there's an inscription carved around the top. Erised stra eru oit ube kafru oit unwozi, which, if you write it in the reverse, says, I show you not your face, but your heart's desire. Harry looks into this mirror, and what does he see? He stepped in front of it, top of the next page. And here's where we're going to start getting bogged down. He had to clap his hands to his mouth to stop himself from screaming. He sees something that scares him. He turns around. His heart's pounding. 
for he had seen not only himself in the mirror, but a whole crowd of people standing right behind him. Notice, he sees himself in the mirror here. And all these people around him. Okay? But the room's empty. Breathing very fast, he turned slowly back to the mirror. There he was, reflected in it. Notice, the mirror is showing Harry exactly as he is right now. White and scared looking. And there, reflected behind him, were at least ten others. He looks again, there's nobody there. But still no one was there. Or were they all invisible too? He's thinking, oh, I've got on my invisibility cloak. Was he in fact in a room full of invisible people? And this mirror's trick was that it reflected them, invisible or not? Now, that's an interesting question. And I think the question is interesting because it raises a, an idea that Rowling is going to kind of play with in other books. Is reality composed of only what we see within her novels? No way that it's not. There is another component, another aspect of reality we do not see. How do you know? Book five, The Veil. They go into one of the rooms of the Ministry of Magic, and there is a veil there, and Harry hears voices, and Luna hears voices. There's something behind the veil, right? But there's nothing. When you go and walk behind the veil, there's nothing there. So, Harry asks this question. Was he in a room of invisible people? In other words, is this room, the room Harry's in, full of people just that he can't see? I don't mean invisible because they're wearing some kind of invisibility cloak. Do they exist, let's say, oh, in another level of existence, another plane of existence? He looks in the mirror again. A woman standing right behind his reflection is smiling at him and waving. Okay, so what does that tell us about this person, the woman standing right behind him? She knows him. She recognizes him. She sees him. When? Right now. She's smiling and waving at him. He reaches out. He's like, if she was really there, what does he mean by really? Physically. He'd touch her. Their reflections were so close together, but he felt only air. She and the others existed only in the mirror. She was a very pretty woman. She had dark red hair. And her eyes, Harry thinks, her eyes are just like mine. Edging a little closer to the glass. Bright green, same shape. And now he notices she's crying. But crying, crying, smiling, but crying at the same time. When he first notices her, what's she doing? She's smiling and waving. Now he notices she's no longer waving. What's that telling us about this image in the mirror? It's not like stationary. It's not stationary. It's reacting. it's reacting. In other words, it's existing in time. There is a past, present, and future with the image in the mirror. Okay? He first sees it, it's smiling and waving. Now, it's no longer waving, but it's smiling and crying at the same time. It wasn't crying before. Why is this image now crying? What has Harry done to make the image cry? Notice it. Yes. He reached out and tried to touch her. And she's aware of that. Okay? Now notice that. The image in the mirror is aware. Okay? The inscription says... I show you not your face, but your heart's desire. So is Harry's heart's desire to see his mother crying for him? Does any child want to see his or her mother cry? No. None of us like to see that. So the mirror isn't merely a projection of what's going on in Harry's heart. There is something more to the mirror. What else? He notices now the tall, thin, black-haired man standing next to her. And what does this man do? Puts his arm around her. Why? 
to comfort her. But these are mere images in the mirror, mere projections, we are led to believe, of Harry's heart. And yet the man standing next to her understands what about the woman beside him? She needs comforting. She needs consoling. Why? Because she's crying. She's smiling, and yet she's crying at the same time. Go figure, guys, right? You know, women. He wore glasses, and his hair was very untidy. What does Harry realize? Damn. I've got mom's eyes, but I've definitely got dad's hair and dad's bad eyesight. It sticks up at the back, just as Harry's. Notice, he's so close to the mirror now that his nose was nearly touching that of his reflection. And you can almost hear him. Don't touch the mirror, Lady Galadriel. Touch the water. Why does she use a mirror, by the way? What other mirror is there in fantasy literature? Through the looking glass. Alice in Wonderland? How does Alice enter Wonderland? Not in Alice in Wonderland, but in the book titled Through the Looking Glass. She goes through the mirror. Okay. Mom? Dad, they just look at him, smiling. And slowly, Harry looks into the faces of the other people. He sees other pairs of eyes like his, other noses like his, other hair, other knobby knees. The Potters smiled and waved. The Potters isn't just Lily and James. It's all the Potters in the mirror smile and wave at him. And he stared hungrily back, his hands pressed flat against the glass, as though he was hoping to fall right through it and reach them. And now notice that. He's, he's pushing on this mirror. Like, please, let it. What is his heart's deepest desire? What's the mirror show, showing him right now? Himself, as he is right now, surrounded by all of his family. Isn't his heart's deepest desire to be reunited with his family? How can that happen? He has to die. So is Harry's deepest desire when he's 11 years old to die? So he can be rejoined with his family? If it is, why doesn't he go off, you know, in the woods? You know, cut his wrists and bleed to death. Because it's not that kind of death that will take him there. He had a powerful kind of ache inside him, half joy, half terrible sadness. Why half and half? What can't he do with them? He's never seen The Martian, apparently, or read the novel that it's based on. What does he not know to do? Ooh, let me go get a blackboard. Let me write. Mom, what can you tell me about? Because she could probably get something there and answer it back. How long he stood there, he didn't know. The reflections did not fade, and he looked and looked until a distant noise brought him back to his senses. I'll come back. He tells Ron, Ron, you should have woken me up. I'd like to see your mom and dad, Ron says. Harry, and I want to see all your family. Well, what can Harry do to see all Ron's family? Go to his house. <laughs> right? Ron, you can see them any old time. Just come around my house this summer. So, the next night, Harry and Ron go. Harry sees his parents. Page 210. And he says to Ron, See? I can't see anything. Look! Look at them all! Where is Harry standing? Where is Ron standing? standing directly. Harry's standing directly in front of the mirror. Where is Ron? He's off to the side. He doesn't see from the same angle. He doesn't have the same perspective. Okay? Ron says, I can see only you. Look in it properly. Go on, stand where I am. Harry steps aside. Ron stands in front of him. Ron was staring transfixed at his image. Look at me. Can you see all your family around you? No, I'm alone. But I'm different. In other words, 
What Ron sees is not himself as he is right now. Harry sees himself as he is right now, surrounded by his family. Ron sees what? He's older, he's different, he's head boy, Harry. What? He kind of says that, you know, like, you? I am. I'm wearing the badge like Bill used to. I'm holding the house cup and the Quidditch cup. And I'm Quidditch captain. He's like, thank you, Jesus. All my prayers are answered right here. All he needs is a beautiful girl. He doesn't have that yet. Ron tears his eyes away to look at Harry. Do you think this mirror shows the future? How can it? All my family are dead. Little bit of logic would tell Harry what's the answer to that question. I'm now living. I will at some point become unliving. I will be dead. And therefore, I will be with my family. Even if that means we're just dead and non-existent. Let me have another look. You had it all last night to yourself. Give me a bit more time. Harry, you're only holding the Quidditch cup. What's interesting about that? I want to see my parents. In other words, you just want something. Harry's saying what? This is who I am. Okay? He's never known his parents. Don't push me. And they hear a noise outside. Quick. And they run back to the room. Ron, the next night, says, you shouldn't go. Here he goes. Here he goes. He gets in there. Page 212. Nothing to stop him from staying here all night with his family. Nothing at all except so. Back again, Harry. Uh, and there's Albus Dumbledore. I, I, I didn't see you, sir. Strange how nearsighted being invisible can make you. What's he mean? What are you when you're nearsighted? He sees stuff up close really well, but something that's far away. Nearsighted, he's talking about looking in the mirror. Dumbledore's not that much farther away than the mirror. But what's he mean? He means, Harry, you have tunnel vision. Broaden your perspective. So you, like hundreds before you, have discovered the delights of the mirror of Erised. I didn't know that's what it was called. But I expect you've realized by now what it does. What's Dumbledore doing? Teaching. He's the headmaster. He uses the Socratic method. He asks questions. He wants to pull the answers out of Harry. Uh, it shows me my family. And it showed your friend Ron himself as head boy. How did, I don't need a cloak to become invisible. Okay. Hold on to that statement. And when we get there, remember it when we get to book seven. Okay? Because Dumbledore has just said, I don't need a cloak to make myself invisible. He, he can do it with a spell of some kind. Now, can you think what the Mirror of Error said shows us all? That is, okay, Harry, based upon your experience, and upon your friend Ron's experience, extrapolate. What does it show everybody who looks into it? <laughs> Shakes his head. He doesn't have a clue. Why? Not a bad mind, but really not a great one either. <laughs> Let me explain. The happiest man on earth would be able to use the mirror of Erised like a normal mirror. That is, he would look into it and see himself exactly as he is. Does that help? Harry. Uh, it shows us what we want, whatever we want. And the happiest man on earth, okay, would see what? Himself as he is. Why? He has no desires. He has no needs. He is perfectly content. Dumbledore says, um, yes and no. It shows us nothing more or less than the deepest, most desperate desire of our hearts. You, who have never known your family, see them standing around you. Ronald Weasley, who has always been overshadowed by his brother, sees himself standing alone. The mirror will give us neither knowledge or truth. Has Dumbledore's answer given us everything about it? Because I'm going to say no. Dumbledore frequently gives Harry answers in books 1 through 6. But the answers he gives Harry are not the full truth. They are some of the truth, right? 
Men have wasted away before it, entranced by what they have seen or been driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. If it shows the deepest desires of your heart, does that mean Ron wants to be Quidditch captain, head boy, blah, 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 blah? Or does it just mean he wants to stand out for once? Well, he does stand out. He makes an ass of himself. For example, in the fourth book, he makes an ass of himself the way really nobody else in his family would, except for Percy in the fifth book. Okay. The mirror will be moved to a new home tomorrow, Harry. If you ever do run across it, you will now be prepared. What has Dumbledore just told Harry? You know how it works. Hint, hint, hint. In other words, this is all part of the preparation for the end of the novel. What is Dumbledore doing? I said his name means, you know, white bumblebee. Okay? White. It's the color of purity. It's the color of holiness within Christian symbolism. Okay? But he's a bumblebee. What do bumblebees do? They flit about from flower to flower. Here, what is Dumbledore doing? He's managing everything. He's like the grand chess master. He's putting things into place. Why did he have Hagrid go to Gringotts? What did he get from Vault 753? The Philosopher's Stone. Why? Was it not safe there? There was an attempted break-in. Okay. Is Hagrid really the safest person to give the Philosopher's Stone to? I mean, give him a little bit of whiskey. There it is again. And... Hagrid will do what? He'll spill the beans. Okay? So, Harry goes back to his room. Or, excuse me. Harry asks Dumbledore, what do you see when you look in the mirror? I see myself holding a pair of thick woolen socks. And Harry's like, get out of here, crazy old man. Okay, if Dumbledore is telling the truth, I have no idea if he is or not, what does that suggest? He's pretty content. Why would you need thick woolen socks? Yeah, if you've ever been in a castle before, okay, last winter, my uh, my eldest daughter was teaching English in Prague, the Czech Republic. So my whole family took ten days, fifteen days, I can't remember, ten days, and we went to Prague for Christmas. And we went to Prague Castle, and it was the damn coldest day that we were there. I mean, it was thirty degrees, and I am not kidding because I've been in sub-zero temperatures, it felt below zero. And there's no heat in the castle. So we're walking around for hours in the castle. And what's a castle made out of? Stone. What does stone do when it gets cold? It just sucks in that cold, man. Okay. And we froze. I mean, by the time we walked out of there, we, my son, was who has no fat whatsoever on him, was blue, okay, because he was freezing so bad. So probably telling the truth there. So we get to chapter Nicholas Flamel, and they put two and two together. Okay, so we're going to skip a bunch. We get to chapter Nor Norbert, their Norwegian Ridgeback. Harry and uh, the others get caught, so they get detention in the Forbidden Forest with Hagrid. What kind of detention is this for Harry? Thank you. This is fun. They get to go, first of all, in the forbidden forest. It's forbidden. So what do the kids naturally want to do? Okay. And he gets to go with Hagrid. Okay. So you get, who goes in? Harry Potter, Draco Malfoy, Neville. Okay. Does Hermione go? Uh, Ron's hurt. Ron got what bit by uh, Norbert. So let's see. Filch is leading. Yeah, Hermione's there. Okay, and Hermione Granger. Okay, so Hagrid divides them up. How does he divide first? So we also have Hagrid and Fang, the 
uh, Irish Wolfhound or something like that. Okay. So how does he divide them up first? Uh, Neville with uh, Draco. You have Neville, Draco, and, and Fank. Yeah. And then Harry, Hermione, and Hagrid. Okay. Take favorites. <laughs> yeah, really. So why does he have to redo the mix? Because Draco plays a joke on Neville. Neville sends up red sparks. And Hagrid says, okay, this isn't going to work. So he redoes it. And so instead, we get Draco and Harry and Fang, and Neville and Hermione and Hagrid. Okay? So what are they doing in the Forbidden Forest? So you got to find out what's killing um, unicorns. I was going to say centaurs, but it's not centaurs. First, they want to find the, the wounded centaur, uh, unicorn. So, page 253, they run into some centaurs. And Hagrid says, um, you seen anything? Page 253, Ronan says, looking up at the sky, Mars is bright tonight. Hagrid says, yeah. Glad we run into you. There's a unicorn hurt. The Ronin, innocent are always the first victim. So it has been for ages past. So it is now. Yeah, but have you seen anything, Ronan? Anything unusual? Mars is bright tonight. Uh, anything a bit near home? So you haven't noticed anything strange? The forest hides many secrets. Shut up, man. Just tell me something clear. Okay, Bane comes in. You seen anything strange? Mars is bright. <laughs> yeah, we've heard. Well, if you see anything, they go off. Hagrid, never try and get a straight answer out of a centaur. Ready stargazers, not interested in anything closer in the moon. Okay. So Harry's off with Draco, and he says, they see some of the silvery stuff, and they keep walking towards it. Page 255. There's splashes of the blood on the roots of a tree as though the poor creature had been thrashing around in pain close by. Harry can see a clearing ahead through the tangled branches of an ancient oak. And he says, look, holding out his arm to stop Malfoy. He doesn't say, look. He says, look. Why did he throw his arm out? To protect Malfoy. Malfoy, his arch enemy. He doesn't say, Draco, go check that out. <laughs> you lead, I'll follow. <laughs> something bright white was gleaming on the ground. They inch closer. It's the unicorn. And then something comes up behind the unicorn, dripping unicorn blood from it. Malfoy runs. Harry's head feels like it's going to burst. And a centaur comes and pulls Harry to his feet. 257. Centaur says, my name is Ferenc. You're the Potter boy. Forest isn't safe, at night, especially for you. Can you ride? It will be quicker. He gets on Harry's back. Harry gets on his back. That'd be weird the other way. Harry gets on the centaur's back. Bane comes in. Man, I'm so tired. What are you? Dog had surgery last week. He had me up twice last night. What are you doing? You have a human on your back. Have you no shame? Do you realize who this is? Ferenc says. This is the Potter boy. The quicker he leaves the forest, the better. What does Bane say? No skin off my nose. I don't care who he is. Have you, what have you been telling him? We're sworn not to set ourselves against the heavens. In other words, we don't set ourselves against fate. What will be, will be, and we're not going to stop what will be. Ronan says, I'm sure Ferenc was acting for the best. Bane, for the best? What's that to do with us? We are concerned only with ourselves. Ferenc says, do you not see the unicorn? Do you not understand why it was killed? Or have the planets not let you in on that secret? Notice, Ferenc knows why it was killed. He says, I set myself against what is lurking in this forest, Bane. Yes, with humans alongside me, if I must. Now, alongside me, in this particular instance, means on me. <laughs> so Bane and Ronan go away, and Friends is left there, and Harry's like, well, golly gee, Mr. Friends, why is Bane so angry? 
what was that thing you saved me from? Do you know what unicorn blood's used for? He goes, no, we haven't gotten that far. We've only used the horn and tail hair. Why? They grow back. Blood, you got to kill them to get the blood. That's because it's a monstrous thing to slay a unicorn. So what do you do? You drink unicorn blood, and what kind of existence do you have? A half-life. And we're told, what else? A cursed life. It's not just cursed for a little while. It's you drink that, you curse yourself. Harry, well, who'd be that desperate? I mean, if you're going to be cursed forever, death's better, isn't it? Death's better. What has Harry just said? Death is preferable to some things. Now, most people in our society would say, huh? What? What? Give me one thing death's preferable to. Like, more taxes? I'll take more taxes. Uh, poverty? I'll take poverty. Uh, hunger? I'll take... For ends, yes it is. Unless all you need is to stay alive long enough to drink something else. Something that will bring you back to full strength. And Harry, the philosopher's stone. The elixir of life. Come on, Harry. Come on. Not a bad mind. Prove it to me. Can you think of nobody who has waited many years to return to power, who has clung to life, awaiting their chance? It was as though an iron fist had suddenly clenched around Harry's heart. Do you mean that was Volk? And Hagrid jumps in. Okay. Ferenc says, you know, the planets have been wrong. Good luck, Harry Potter. So Harry tells Ron and Hermione he's going to go through the trap door. Why? Because Snape's going to get the stone. And he says, bottom of 270, I'm going out of here tonight. I'm going to try and get the stone. Ron, you're mad. Hermione, you're crazy. You'll get expelled. Harry, so what? Don't you understand? Now listen to the speech, because it's very odd. He says some things that he really shouldn't be saying because they haven't been implied anywhere. Don't you understand? If Snape gets hold of the stone, Voldemort's coming back. Haven't you heard what it was like when he was trying to take over? Okay, Hermione definitely has. She's read everything. Ron, being raised in a wizarding household, definitely has. Where's Harry heard what it was like? There won't be any Hogwarts to get expelled from. He'll flatten it or turn it into a school for the dark arts. Losing points doesn't matter anymore, can't you see? Do you think he'll leave you and your families alone if Gryffindor wins the House Cup? In other words, Quidditch is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. If I get caught before I can get to the stone... Well, I'll have to go back to the Dursleys and wait for Voldemort to find me there. It's only dying a bit later than I would have because I'm never going over to the dark side. Who said? No, son, join me and together we'll rule them. It's like Darth Vader asking Han Solo to rule with him. Where has somebody said, Harry, join the dark side? Is it Malfoy on the train? Well, Potter, you need to be a bit more polite or you go the way your parents did. Is that it? Where else has the dark side been talked about? It hasn't. This is an example, I think, of she says something here because she's thinking farther on. okay, And it gets included, but it doesn't have any previous justification for it within the novel. Especially when he says... And I'll wait for Voldemort to find me there. He doesn't know yet that Voldemort's looking for him and trying to kill him. Dumbledore's going to tell him that afterwards. Okay? Because I'm never going over to the dark side. I'm going through that trap door tonight. And nothing you two can say is going to stop me. They don't try to stop him. They say we're going to go with you. Okay? So, they go through... And what does it take to get to the stone? What has Dumbledore come up with? A series of trials. Okay. Each trial performed by a different professor slash teacher slash somebody. So you have the trap door, which is fluffy. 
which is Hagrid. What's the next thing? Devil Snare, which is, um, yeah, Sprout, Ringer, <coughs> sorry, yeah, Sprout, we'll just leave that there, okay? How do they get through that one? Fire. It's flame. Yep. Hermione's like, whoa, we just need some flame, and Harry's like, are you a witch or not? Come on, you can make flame. We find out. Uh, we found out earlier in the Quidditch chapter, it's one of her little specialties, conjuring up flame. Okay? What comes next? Flying keys. Flying keys. Which is? It's Flitwick. Okay. What comes after that? Louder? Is it the wizard chess? No, potions comes last. Almost last. Oh, that's right. It is the troll. Troll. Already knocked out. Quirrell. Then, chess match. That's one, two, three, four, five. Chess match. That's McGonagall. Potions. <coughs> Severus Snape. Notice the SS, by the way. What's the last trial? The mirror. the mirror with Dumbledore. Okay, so we're going to skip some of these, but look at this one. What do we see has to happen in the chess match? In golly gee, it's just coincidence that Harry's been learning chess from Ron. What does Ron do? He sacrifices himself. He says, page 282. No, 283. We're nearly there. Let me think. Let me think. Ron says, yeah, it's the only way. I've got to be taken. Harry and Hermione. No, that's chess, says Ron. you got to make some sacrifices. I take one step forward. She'll take me. That leaves you free to checkmate the king, Harry. But do you want to stop Snape or not? Ron, if you don't hurry, he'll already have the stone. Ready? Okay, now does Ron know what's going to happen? No, he, he doesn't know. Okay. And what happens? The queen comes, knocks Ron hard across the head, crashes to the floor, and she drags him aside. Notice they can't go check on Ron, see if he's okay. So potions actually isn't potions, is it? What is it? It's logic. It's logic. Okay. How far would Harry have gotten through these without Hermione and Ron? <laughs> really, he wouldn't have gotten through here. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I mean, even without Hagrid, because he brought the um, thing with him, he wouldn't have got past here. He would have done the flying keys, because he could fly pretty good. Troll's already taken care of. Wouldn't have had a chance here. Definitely wouldn't have had a chance here. So he makes it to the final room. You, Harry says, it was cruel. Cool. Me, but I thought Snape. Severus, yes, yeah, Severus does seem the type, doesn't he? So useful to have him swooping around like an overgrown bat. It's the first time she makes that reference, and yet Snape is going to be referred to in several other places or described as a bat. We're going to see him in one scene in the seventh book. He leaves Hogwarts by running and jumping through a window and flying like a bat. Okay? She intentionally leads us to believe that Snape is some kind of vampire. And yet she has said in interviews, simple red herring. She wanted to throw everybody off the scent. She wanted everybody to think Snape was vampiric. Okay? So he finds out Snape was trying to save him, etc. Harry still can't believe it's Quirrell. Right? 290. Because Harry overheard Quirrell talking with Snape. And Quirrell was kind of complaining. Harry, you mean he was there in the classroom with you? Very bottom of 290. Quarrel. He is with me wherever I go. I met him when I traveled around the world, a foolish young man I was then, full of ridiculous ideas about good and evil. Lord Voldemort showed me how wrong I was. What are those ridiculous ideas? He states them in the next sentence. 
There is no good and evil. There is only power in those too weak to seek it. Right? So, Voldemort finally speaks and says, let me talk to him. Page 294. Don't be a fool. Better save your own life. Join me or you'll meet the same end as your parents. But here he said, what, 20, 30 pages previously? I'll never join the dark side. But nobody asked him to yet. Is Harry clairvoyant? Now there's a possibility, because of something we learn in later novels, why Harry says that. But I don't think that's it. So, how does Harry defeat Voldemort? I don't mean how does he get the stone out of the mirror. How does he defeat Voldemort? He touches, he touches Quirrell. Does Voldemort slash Quirrell burst into a million pieces of dust like in the stupid film? No. Harry passes out and we don't know what actually happens. So he wakes up. Page 295. Something gold glinting above him. He thinks it's the snitch. He tries to move his arms. He can't. It's Dumbledore. First word. He's got the stone. Calm yourself. Harry looks around. There's all kinds of stuff next to him. And Dumbledore says, tokens from your friends and such. How long have I been here? Three days. Why three days? Yeah. <laughs> Where was Harry when Dumbledore found him? He was in the underground cavern thingy. He goes in one in every book, by the way. It's the whole, you know, hero's journey kind of thing. Harry talks about the stone. Dumbledore says, okay, you won't be distracted. Okay, so let's talk about the stone. Harry says, but when Dumbledore says, the stone's going to be destroyed, 297. But, but your friend, Nicholas Flamel, who, by the way, is a real person. Nicholas Flamel was a 16th century French alchemist who had a wife named Perinelle. Same names that are in here, right? Oh, you know about Nicholas, Dumbledore says. You did do the thing properly, didn't you? What does that first did mean? What is that telling us? No, it's not that he has doubt. Yeah. In other words, I expected you to do it. But you did it properly. What does he mean by properly? You researched. You went to the library and actually did research. Well done, Harry. He says, well... Nicholas and I have had a little chat, and we agree it's best for the stone. Harry said, but they'll die. Well, they've got enough elixir to set their affairs in order. But and then, yes, they will die. Harry has a look of amazement on his face. And Dumbledore says, to one as young as you, I'm sure it seems incredible, but to Nicholas and Perinelle, it really is like going to bed after a very, very long day. What's the longest you've been awake? 38 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. When I was an undergraduate, I went to a school outside Chattanooga, and I lived in San Jose, California, which is about 50 miles from San Francisco. I would drive back and forth at the end of semesters, or the beginning of semester. I would drive from San Jose to Chattanooga nonstop. That is, I wouldn't spend the night anywhere. I would just stay awake the whole time. That's about 2,500 miles. If I was driving fast, I could do it about 34 hours. If I was driving slow, it'd be about 39 hours. But whichever way, if I'm leaving Chattanooga, arriving in San Jose, or vice versa, by the time I arrived, I'm so jacked up on caffeine and no-dose and such, you know, that I'm like this. <laughs> Doing it in the winter and going over Mont Eagle Mountain with the ice is, you know, that's how Nicholas Purnell kind of felt, I think. Ready for a long nap. And then notice what Dumbledore says. After all, to the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. So death is not what? The end. If you've ever read Philip Pullman's his Dark Materials series, Golden Compass, Amber Spyglass, The Subtle Knife, Pullman does not believe the same way J.K. Rowling does. 
Okay? Pullman is an out and out, blatant, over the top, let's say, atheist. He says, you die, that's it. Your body disintegrates, what you think of as your soul or your consciousness, that's just it, no more. You just become nothing, essentially, right? Rowling doesn't agree with that, pretty clearly. Within the novel, she doesn't agree with that. We're going to see somebody die, and somebody's going to say to Harry, come on, Harry, you're going to see him again. You heard the voices, didn't you? And he's like, because the person who says that, you know, it's like she's tripping acid all the time. She's really out there most of the time. To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. Notice what has to occur. The mind needs to be what? Well-organized. Well In other words, it's got to have its priorities. What else? Death is a great adventure if you're prepared. That's what it means to be well organized. You know, the stone was really not such a wonderful thing. Why not? Look what he says about it. What does the stone do? As much money and life as you could want. Now, I bet if I were to take a poll in this room, and I said, if you could have as much money in the world as you wanted, would you want that? And I bet probably 99% would go, yes, where do I sign up? And I could give you unending life. I bet quite a few, maybe not 99% would say, you mean I could be filthy rich and never die? Okay, where do I sign up? As much money in life as you could want. The two things, Dumbledore calls these, the two things, what? Most human beings would choose above all. Trouble is, humans do have a knack of choosing precisely those things that are worst for them. Okay? He says these are the two things most humans would choose. And then he says, humans have a knack of choosing the things that are precisely the worst for them. So, if these are the two things most people would choose, and most people choose the things that are worst for them, what are the things that are then best for them? If the things that are best are the opposite of these, is it then poverty <laughs> and death? Is he saying, go and sell all you have and kill yourself? Is he going to modify Jesus' saying a little bit? When Jesus said, go and sell all you have and... What's the next part of the phrase? Follow me. And yet, what does he say his followers must do? Deny themselves, take up their cross. Okay? So it's not death per se. It's kind of death to the world. That is, death to the joys of this. It doesn't mean you walk around, you know, with a bag over you and say, life sucks. He says, you don't say, this is what brings me happiness. Or this is what brings me happiness. Or this, if a Rolex, is what brings me happiness. Or this, if it's a $5,000 suit, is what brings me happiness. Or a $500,000 car. Okay. Harry lay there, lost for words. Why? He's 11 years old. Dumbledore's words are going whoosh, right over his head. He doesn't have a clue what he means. All right? So they keep talking. You know who? Call him Voldemort, Harry. Always use the proper name for things. Yeah, him. Harry says, um, he's not gone, is he? I mean, he'll come back. Dumbledore says, well, you might have delayed him. And, and maybe he'll keep being delayed, but no, he's not gone forever. He says, I want to know the truth about some things. Mm, the truth. Beautiful and terrible, Dumbledore says. I'll answer your questions unless I have a good reason not to, in which case I won't, but I won't lie to you. Okay. 
Why did Voldemort want to kill me in the first place? Can't answer that. Next question. First thing you ask me, I cannot tell you. It's not true. He is lying. He can tell him. He won't tell him. Right? He thinks he's too young. He says, when you're ready, you will know. Why couldn't Quirrell touch me? Your mother died to save you. He says, and she left a mark on you. Harry kind of looks. She goes, no, not that kind of mark. Right? Love, as powerful as your mother's, leaves its own mark. Even though the person who loved us is gone, it will give us some protection forever. It's in your very skin. Right? Harry, invisibility cloak? You any clue about that? Yeah, your dad left it with me. But what did he say when he caught Harry in front of the mirror the third night? I don't need an invisibility cloak to be invisible. Then why would he have asked James to lend him the invisibility cloak? Hmm. So Harry talks about Quirrell, and he finds out Harry's father saved Snape's life. He doesn't know how. He doesn't know why. And the book ends with Dumbledore essentially rigging the system so that Gryffindor wins the House Cup. How does he rig the system? Gives extra points. Harry gets extra points for courage, you know, defeating Voldemort. Ron gets extra points for great Quidditch match. Hermione gets great extra points for great show of logic. What puts them over the top? Neville. Why Neville? Neville, Neville stand, stood up to who? Standed up to who? Harry, Ron, Harry, Ron and Hermione. And what does he say about that? Yeah, it takes even greater courage to stand up to your friends than it does to your enemies. Okay? So that gives him 10 points, gives him the house cup, and all that kind of stuff. Why else does he single Neville out at the end? This is headmastery stuff. Bingo. He's trying to build up Neville. Is Neville the bumbling idiot everybody makes him out to be? Most of the time, yes. But he has what? He's got a good heart. He's trying. Okay. Go from there to now we have Harry's second year. Okay. Where does it begin? During the summer, where all the books begin. It's his birthday. What is Harry expecting on his birthday? Letters from his friends. Because he has friends now. And they said, Harry, we'll write to you. What kind of letters has he gotten? None. Okay. So, he goes out. It's the worst birthday. He goes out, and he's got to trim the hedges and everything, and he plays a game, like, plays a joke on Dudley, he gets in trouble in front of him because of it, pretends to do magic. He gets sent to his room that evening while the Dursleys are going to be... Um, entertaining some people that Mr. Dursley hopes he can get a big order of drills from us, make a killing for his company. And so Harry's up in his room, page 12, 13, and he needs Dobby. Describe Dobby. Little pointy ears, big googly eyes. Okay. Why is he there? Talk Harry not to go back to Hogwarts. Right? Um, Harry offers Dobby a seat on his bed. Says, sit down, please. Dobby, you know, bursts into tears. Says, I've never been offered a seat by a... Okay? Harry hears what life is like for Dobby. Dobby describes it. Page 14. Harry's like, I thought I had a bed. Staying here for another four weeks. This makes the Dursley sound almost human. Can't anyone help you? Can't I? Dobby starts, you know, tears again. Harry Potter asks if he can help Dobby. Dobby's heard of your greatness, sir, but of your goodness. Greatness, write it down. Greatness, goodness. Harry's like, everybody knows Hermione's, you know. Harry Potter's 
humble, modest, great, good, humble, modest. I mean, you defeated he who must not be hanged. Harry, Voldemort? Ah, speak not the name, you know. What else? You defeated him again, second time. So, great, good, humble, modest, top of the next page, valiant, bold. He says, you got to stay here, Harry Potter. You're too good to lose. You will be in mortal danger. Harry Potter must not put himself in danger. Harry mentions Dumbledore, and, you know, Dobby kind of bows, and, you know, almost like he's in prayer to him. Um, Harry finds out Dobby's been stopping his letters, and Dobby, you know, drops the pudding. Harry gets rescued by Fred and Ron and George. Uh, I'm going to skip a bunch. They go off to Flourish and Blots. What happens at Flourish and Blots without spending a lot of time? Who do they meet? They meet the Malfoys. And Gilderoy Lockhart. Gilderoy, it's a name like Voldemort, okay? Gild, or Gilda, and Roy. Roy, again, is from French. Ra, it means king. Gild, if something is guilt, G-I-L-T, or gilded, what does it mean? Artificially more valuable. It's artificially covered with gold, yeah. Okay? So, gold... Or guilt, king. What? Not a real king, in other words. A real king is real gold, so to speak. Solid gold. In other words, king all the way through. This is a gilded king. He looks like a king. What does everybody think, everybody, a.k.a. Hermione and Mrs. Weasley, think of Gilroy Locker? He's amazing. Why? Because he's a looker, first of all. And he wrote all these great books, which Hermione has read all. Okay? What kind of books? His autobiographies, essentially. Okay? So what happens while they're there and they meet the Malfoys and they see Gilderoy Lockhart? Malfoy and Arthur Weasley get into a fight. Okay? Page 61. Draco says, famous Harry Potter. Can't even go to a bookshop without making the front page. Ginny, leave him alone. Because Ginny gets to go off to school this year. Oh, you got yourself a girlfriend. Ron, oh, it's you. Looking at Malfoy as if he were... <laughs> I love her little subtle humor. Looking at Malfoy as if he were something unpleasant on the sole of his shoe. Bet you're surprised to see Harry here, eh? Not surprised as I am to see you in a shop, Weasley. Talks about his parents. And then we hear, well, 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 Arthur Weasley. It was Mr. Malfoy. First time we've heard him speak. First time we've been introduced to him. Lucius, says, me, says Mr. Weasley. All those raids, I hope they're paying you overtime. Why? Because the Ministry of Magic is raiding people's homes that they think have dark art stuff. He reaches into Ginny's cauldron and he pulls out a book that looks kind of like this one. All beaten, taped together. And he says, obviously not. Dear me, notice what he says here. What's the use of being a disgrace to the name of wizard if they don't even pay you well for it? Notice what, Art, what um, Malfoy would be willing to do. Yeah, I would disgrace the name of wizard if you pay me enough. Okay? Arthur, we have a very different idea of what disgraces the name of wizard. Clearly, the company you keep, he looks at the Grangers, Hermione's parents. Okay? And Mr. Weasley just launches into him, just in right over, you know, Jenny's cauldron. Hagrid breaks him up. Page 63. You should have ignored him, Arthur. Rotten to the core. The whole family, everyone knows that. No Malfoy is worth listening to. Bad blood. 
gotten to the core. Now, this is an idea Rowling is going to play with in the next five books. Is anybody rotten to the core? But they're not bodies. They're not people. Is any person, is even Tom Riddle, Lord Voldemort, rotten to the core? Okay. So they go back home. Mrs. Weasley's just fitting mad. I mean, just spitting nails. They try to get through the barrier, and Harry and Ron can't. So Ron comes up with the bright idea. Let's fly up to school. Yeah, that'll be cool. Take dads flying forward to Anglia. Okay. They fly it up to school. They get seen. They get caught by Snape. Okay. Snape wants to get them, kick them out. Dumbledore says, it's not your call. <coughs> it's McGonagall's. And what does Harry show to McGonagall that night? I mean, the term hasn't really even begun. He says, well, term hasn't even really begun, so you, you shouldn't really take points away from her house, should you? And the narrator kind of like, and she kind of looks at him with a little <coughs> smirk on her face like, well done, kid, but you're still getting detention, okay? So we have our first class with Gilderoy Lockhart. What's he there teaching? Defense against the dark arts. Why? Because Quirrell's dead. <laughs> he was the professor. Previous Defense Against the Dark Arts. And how good is he at it? He's written all these great books. They're the textbooks for the class. Shouldn't say this, but I will. Whenever you have a class where the professor requires you to buy the professor's books, you know, maybe be just a little bit... Uh, there's some ethical issues there. It, it, what kind of class does he do his first class? <coughs> He gives them a quiz on him, okay? But he has a practical lesson. Now, practical lessons are good. What kind of practical lesson? Yeah, put the Cornish Pixies back in the bottle. And how good is he at doing that? He can't, okay? Who does end up doing it? Hermione, Ron, Harry, okay? And so they leave the class, and Ron says, can you believe him? Hermione, he just wants to give us hands-on experience. Harry, hands-on? He didn't have a clue. Rubbish. You've read his books. Look at all those amazing things he's done. Hermione equates something written as what? Truth. Truth. Something done. Okay? So, we get introduced to this idea early on that not everything you read is what? True. You need an example? New York Times. Washington Post. I mean, name your rag. <laughs> name your newspaper. I don't care what side of the political spectrum. They all lie, frankly. <laughs> and that's an idea she's going to follow. Because we've heard about the Daily Prophet. When are we going to hear more about the Daily Prophet later? And it's in the pocket of the government. So who do we come to think we should believe later on? The Quibbler, which is our National Enquirer. Okay. <laughs> or the Star. That's even better. Because the National Enquirer doesn't do the stuff about, you know, uh, Johnny Cash or Elvis Presley being found on Mars, you know, through some telescope. Weird stuff like that. That's the kind of stuff the Quibbler does. Okay. So we get to chapter Mud, Bloods, and Murmurs. Skipping a bunch. It's Harry's second year. Oliver Wood, who's very angry that they didn't win the Quidditch Cup, says, we're going to practice early this year. So they go out to practice Quidditch. And they're out there getting ready. And in come all the Slytherin team. And they say, we've got special permission from Professor Snape. But Wood already booked the pitch. So why does Snape's permission kind of, you know, trump that? Anyways, they see they also have new 
brooms. On page 112, Malfoy says, good, aren't they? But perhaps the Gryffindor team will be able to raise some gold and get new brooms too. I mean, you could raffle off those clean sweep fives. I expect a museum would bid for them. They all laugh. Hermione, at least no one on the Gryffindor team had to buy their way in. They got in on pure talent. No one asked your opinion, you filthy little mudblood. And all hell breaks loose. All hell is defined principally as Ron and Frank and George. Okay? Ron, specifically how? What does he do? He sucks. Yeah. He tries to curse Malfoy with his wand, which he's holding backwards. <laughs> and which is broken because the Whomping Willow beat the wood out of it. Okay? So eat slugs and you know curses himself. So they go off to Hagrid's, and Hagrid and Ron explain what mud blood means. Hagrid also tells them about the dark arts job, page one fifteen. When Hermione says, "Well, you shouldn't talk bad about you know Gilderoy Lockhart," Professor Dumbledore obviously thought he was the best man for the job. Hagrid, he was the only man for the job. And I mean the only one, getting very difficult to find anyone. People aren't too keen to take it on, see? They're starting to think it's jinxed. No one's lasted for a long while now. Notice we're not told how long. We're not told how long until when? The seventh book, actually. We get a little indication in the fifth book, but we don't know actually how long until the seventh book. How long is the Dark Arts job? Harry is now what age? 12. The defense against the dark arts job has not been held by anybody longer for a year going back to just before, excuse me, just after Harry's first birthday. So 12 years Dumbledore has had to get a new defense against the dark arts teacher every year. Yeah, no kidding. They can't find people. Okay. So I'm skipping a bunch. Chapter 8, we get the death day party of nearly headless Nick. What death day party. What day is his birthday? Excuse me, death day. 10.31. It's his 500th. That tells us the time frame for the novels. It's 1992. Okay. He died in 1492. Harry's 12, so Harry is born in 1980. So James and Lily then died 10, 31, 81. Okay. Why? She started writing it when? In 1990. Okay, so she has Harry. Um, or she has the first novel essentially set in 1991 after she had begun writing it. So he, they leave the death day party, and that's when Harry hears the voice the first time. Kill, rip, tear, etc. Right. I'm going to skip a bunch. They go off and find the voice. They find Mrs. Norris. We'll skip all that. But what does Harry want to do to Mrs. Norris? Nope. Just the opposite. They find her tied. Okay? She's hanging near Mudblood's Beware. Air of Slytherin, you know, will be released or something. Can't remember the exact phrase. The writing on the wall. Um, Chamber of Secrets has been open. Enemies of the air beware. Harry says, Ron says, we should get out of here. Harry, should we try and help? Okay, describe Mrs. Norris. Okay, yeah, she is now, but when she's not petrified normally. She's Filch's cat, which means what? No, Filch takes care of her. Why is she not liked? She watches the kids, the students. She's like Filch's eyes around the school, okay? Whenever students are doing something they shouldn't be, 
The cat's always there somewhere, okay? So now they find the cat tied up. And Harry's like, shouldn't we help Ron? Mm -mm, we should get out of here. Malfoy shows up, okay? So Snape thinks Harry's guilty, and therefore he ought to lose Quidditch privileges because he doesn't want Harry to win. Dumbledore says, don't worry, he's not... Phil, um, Norris isn't dead. She's just frozen. Okay. So they have history and magic. Hermione asks Professor Benz, who's a ghost, been dead a long time. Is there any truth to the Chamber of Secrets? He says no. Students start peppering him with questions. He finally says, if Dumbledore can't find it, it can't be real. Okay. In that chapter, the writing on the wall, page 155, they notice spiders. Harry, Ron, and Hermione go back to the scene of the crime, and they notice spiders leaving the wall going out through the window. And Ron kind of backs up from them, and Hermione laughs. Ron, I don't mind them dead. I, I just don't like the way they move. Hermione giggles. It's not funny, says Ron. You must know, when I was three, okay, so when Ron was three, Fred and George would be five, because they're two years older. Fred turned my teddy bear into a great big filthy spider because I broke his toy broomstick. Okay, so Fred's like the Einstein of the wizarding world when it comes to doing magic, if he can do that at five. I mean, what are they doing their first year in McGonagall's Transfiguration class? Turning pin cushions into other things, it takes a bit longer before they turn an inanimate object into a living object. Fred does what? He turns Ron's teddy bear into a spider. It's pretty advanced transfiguration, isn't it? And he does it at five years old without a wand. There's a problem there. That's a problem in the writing that doesn't get accounted for. I mean, I've asked tons of students, tons of classes. Oh, I have she says in, you know, and she comes up with things in Pottermore. Doesn't matter what she comes up with. Within the world that she creates in this series of books, that is a huge, big, gaping flaw. We're going to see the same kind of thing in the fourth book. Little two-year-old making a slug get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then put, popping it, okay? Two-year-old doesn't have the magical ability, we get told in a couple of places. Anyways, that's why Ron's afraid of spiders. So, Rogue Bludger, next chapter. Harry gets hit by it. Lockhart tries to fix his arm. Harry's like, no, please no, but he does. And he wakes up. He's in the hospital room. He wakes up to what? Page 177. Dobby sitting on his chest. And Dobby says, I thought I stopped you. I, I, the barrier. Harry goes, you? Indeed, yes, sir. 176. Dobby hid, watched Harry Potter, sealed the gateway. Dobby had died on his hands afterwards. Dobby did the bludger. Harry's like, you're trying to kill me. You're trying to save me is going to kill me. Okay. Harry asks Dobby why he wears that ugly, dirty old pillowcase. Middle of 177. Tis a mark of our self-enslavement, sir. Dobby can only be freed if his masters present him with clothes. Harry Potter must not go home. He mentions the bludger. Dobby says, if only Harry Potter knew. Knew what? Top of 178. If he knew what he means to us, to the lowly, the enslaved, we dregs of the magical world. If Harry only knew what he means to all non-magical members of the magical world, or non-wizarding members. So... House elves, goblins, who else is he implying? Centaurs, 
and unicorns, all the magical creatures. And he goes on and says, Dobby remembers how it was when he who must not be named was at the height of his power, sir. We house elves were treated like vermin. He goes, of course, I still am. But mostly, sir, life has improved for my kind since you triumphed over he who must not be named. Harry Potter survived. The Dark Lord's power was broken, and it was a new dawn. Okay? In other words, Harry was a beacon of light. Harry Potter shone, shone like a beacon of hope for those of us who thought the dark days would never end. That's why he says, if anything happens to you, it's going to be even worse for us. Okay? Harry says, I'm not going to go back. I'm not going to stop. Dobby, Harry Potter risked his own life for his friends. So noble, so valiant, etc. And Dumbledore and McGonagall bring somebody else in. Who gets brought in? Colin. Taking pictures with his stupid camera. McGonagall says, what does this mean, Albus? He says it means that the Chamber of Secrets is indeed open again. So now Harry hears it with his own two ears. There is a real Chamber of Secrets. McGonagall, how? Excuse me, who? McGonagall says, not who. Who? But? See what just happened? Rearrange the letters. Go to the end of the novel. Tom Marvolo Riddle. Rearrange the letters. I am Lord Voldemort. So, I'm going to skip a bunch. A whole bunch. Polyjuice potion, all that kind of stuff. The very secret diary. Harry finds this diary. Ron tells him not to trust it. Harry takes it. He goes up to his room. He writes his name on it, or drops a blot of ink, and the blot of ink disappears. He drops his, writes his name on it. His name disappears, and then ink comes back. Hello, Harry Potter. And what does he learn? Through writing in the diary and reading the diary, he goes into the diary. And what does Tom Riddle show him? Hagrid opened the Chamber of Secrets 50 years ago. Okay? Do we know how old the Hagrid is? Okay? It was 50 years ago. Hagrid was a third year. Hagrid is 63. What year was Tom Riddle? He was a fifth year. So Tom Riddle, a.k.a. Lord Voldemort is 65. Okay? Harry <coughs> tells Ron and Hermione it was Hagrid. What has Harry just done that Hermione did earlier in the novel? Yeah, because his seeing all this in the, in the book is essentially the same as what? Is reading it. Okay. He's believing everything Tom Riddle tells him. So he comes out, and what do we see? Harry and Ron and Hermione think they need to go have a talk with uh, Hagrid. So they go down, invisibility cloak, and who shows up? Dumbledore, Fudge, and who else? Lucius Malfoy. So Dumbledore says, you will find I will only have ever really truly left Hogwarts when there is nobody here who is faithful to me. And Malfoy's like, well, that's kind of a noble sentiment. And Hagrid says, and if you want to find anything, follow the spiders. And he's like, and that's just completely weird. <laughs> so where is Hagrid going to be taken and why? What is Azkaban? It's a prison. Do we have a modern equivalent of Azkaban in our world? Would Alcatraz be an equivalent of Azkaban? Think about it for a moment. Who patrols Azkaban? Dementors. 
What do they do? They drive you crazy. Okay, I understand prison guards, 1930s, maybe even today in places, I'm sure today in places you read stories about them, can be pretty inhuman. Can they suck the soul out of you? No, they can't do that. They could beat you to death. They could beat you to death, but then you'd be dead. You wouldn't just be a vegetable. Right? There's a big difference between those. So there's not really a, a parallel to this kind of place. On what basis is Hagrid going to be sent? What kind of trial was there? There wasn't a trial. Was there a trial 50 years ago? Nope. Speculation. He's getting sent where? Okay, let's say in Alcatraz. He's getting sent to Alcatraz on supposition, on presumption of guilt. What does this tell us about the wizarding justice system? Quick to judge. And it's pretty screwed up. It's pretty unfair. Okay? So, Hagrid gets taken away. And there's another attack before Harry and Ron can go off to follow the spiders. Who's hit in the other attack? Um... No, that was actually earlier. We just skipped over that one entirely. Hermione and Penelope Clearwater, Percy's girlfriend. Okay. What do they get from Hermione's hand when they finally go and take it from them? A mirror. Not a mirror. A piece of paper ripped out of a library book. Hermione ripping a piece of paper out of a library book. What's it about? The basilisk. Pipes, okay? So, they go off. They talk to Aragog. They say, thank you, Mr. Aragog. We'll be leaving now. And Aragog's like, no, my family's hungry. We won't be leaving. Aragog tells them Hagrid didn't do what he was charged with. They put it all together. The girl that died 50 years ago is the creeper. <laughs> Moni Myrtle. Um, so, the Chamber of Secrets. Uh, da, 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 da. Ginny wants to talk to Harry and Ron. Percy butts in, so she clams up. And we hear McGonagall say, 293, Harry and Ron over here, this one, they go to talk to her, that Ginny's been taken. And there's a note that says, her skeleton will lie in the chamber forever. So McGonagall's like, we've got to send the kids home. And just at that point, just about, Lockhart wakes up from his nap and comes into the staff room. And they all say, all right, Gilderoy, now's your chance. You've been saying all along. Why do they do that? Yeah, well, are they really trying to out the coward, or do they just want to get him out of their hair? He goes off to his office, which is plastered with what? Posters yeah, posters of himself, pictures of himself. And Harry and Ron follow him. And he says, I, I, I've got to leave. Urgent call. Major duty. How do Harry and Ron, why do Harry and Ron, make him go? Well, you said you could do all this. You're the defense against the dark arts teacher. Notice, they're still holding on to the fiction, even though they know he can't. Then he's the defense against the dark arts teacher, and this ought to be his job. We'll stop there. We're going to pick up next week. So do the third book for next week. We're going to pick up with the chapter, The Heir of Slytherin. We'll finish this fairly quickly. Expect a um, quiz. <laughs>